Very warm greetings to you and welcome to another edition of The Monarchy. I'm Samson Seas and this is the controversial programme about Britain. We give you political stories about the UK, but from a counter-mainstream angle that you are very unlikely to come across on corporate television networks. So let's take a look at today's divisive menu. Manhattan, New York City, September the 11th, 2001. The shocking event led to the declaration of the so-called Global War on Terror, led by the United States government. The world changed after 9-11. Since then, governments across the world, and the British government in particular, have introduced anti-terror laws which have compromised essential liberties in the society. But that was not enough for the British officials. On the morning of July the 7th, 2005, Londoners started their days with the panicking news. On that day, several explosions occurred on the public transport system in the city of London. 56 people, including four alleged suicide bombers, died in three explosions on the London Underground and one explosion on a London bus. Within hours, the British government, the Metropolitan Police, intelligence agencies and many others started to propagate stories that simply did not add up to common sense. Nine years on, and there is still no clear picture of what happened that day. British officials hoped that time will erode the ambiguities, but they are now turned to snowballs attracting more attention among the public. In May 2004, the BBC's investigative current affairs programme, Panorama, had a panel of experts discussing how Britain would react to a terrorist attack just like the future 7-7 bombings. The scenario included three explosions on the London Underground and one of a vehicle. The programme entitled London Under Attack depicted a fictional terrorist attack. It was presented in a documentary style as if it were really happening. Surprisingly, the simulation was as similar as possible to the real event, which happened a month later. This is the kind of terrorist attack the government repeatedly says is going to happen. On the morning of the 7th of July 2005, there was one more territory that has caused controversy ever since. Senior Metropolitan Police Officer Peter Power was conducting a tabletop exercise that morning that not only envisaged the attacks on the underground involving three simultaneous explosions at three tube stations, but a bombing on a bus. On the morning of 7-7 in London, Israeli finance minister of the time, Benjamin Netanyahu, was scheduled for an economic conference in London but he never left his hotel room adjacent to the site of the first explosion. In the confusions after the attacks, the Associated Press reported that Scotland Yard had tipped off the Israeli delegation. A senior Israeli official admitted that minutes before the explosions, it had informed the Israeli delegations that it had received warnings of possible terror attacks. 
Netanyahu and Scotland Yard have since denied the reports. The story itself was being reported by other sources and travelled right around the world's media. The former mayor of New York and a staunch Zionist, Rudy Giuliani, was also in Britain. On July the 6th, he appeared up in Yorkshire where he gave a rousing pro-war and terror speech. He admired Tony Blair while deploring the way the world had allowed terrorists to get out of control through failing to take the problem seriously enough. What was Giuliani doing in London that morning, or indeed in the UK? No one has ever answered that. Was it a coincidence that Giuliani, who was the mayor of New York on 9-11, was in London just the day the London bombs went off? Although there have been suspicions and anecdotal evidence of a fifth or more bombers, the official 7-7 story claims that only four homegrown extremists were responsible for the attacks. They were Mohammed Sadiq Khan, aged 30, from Beeston, Leeds, accused of the Edgware Road Blast, Shehzad Tanweer, aged 22, also from Beeston, accused of the Liverpool Aldgate Blast, Jamaican-born Jermaine Lindsay, aged 19, from Aylesbury, set off the bomb at the carriage heading from Russell Square Station, and Hasib Hussain, the youngest at just 18, blew himself up on the number 30 bus outside Tavistock Square. One may ask why were all these radicals and potential terrorists with links to networks overseas residing in Britain in the years leading up to 7-7? That question is a long and complex one that includes elements of collusion by the state and security services with the extremists. In his book, former British Army officer and intelligence expert Crispin Black wrote of a secret government policy known as the Covenant of Security. He says this refers to the long-standing British habit of providing refuge and welfare to extremists on the unspoken assumption that if we give them a safe haven, they will not attack us. Under the Covenant, Britain spent years harbouring hate-filled preachers like Abu Hamza, former Imam of the Finsbury Park Mosque, and Omar Bakri, former leader of the al Muharjaruns, now Muslims Against Crusades. In fact, at various stages, both men were assets of the MI5 and the MI6. Abu Hamza became an informant for Special Branch and MI5 in 1997, and despite his inflammatory sermons and role in recruiting Muslims for jihad, he was told that what he was doing fell under the freedom of speech. You don't have to worry unless we see blood on the street, the authorities told him. While they were turning a blind eye, Hamza was training young men how to use AK-47s, handguns and mock rocket launchers during country retreats. He was preparing them for the tougher times they could face overseas that the authorities also knew he was funding. Hamza was so protected on British soil that the French even considered kidnapping him. Egypt was so concerned that they offered to swap him for a British prisoner, but they were turned down. Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, was a regular attendee of Hamza's Finsbury Park Mosque before he attempted to down American Airlines Flight 63. Hamza's influence also did not escape those surrounding the future 7-7 bombings. Alleged bombers Mohammed Sadiq Khan, Shehzad Tanweer and Jermaine Lindsay had all attended his sermons at various stages. Was Britain really in such a position that it was safer to harbour extremists than it was to challenge them. One possibility is that the Covenant was really to benefit Britain's foreign policy goals. It's easy for the government to say four crazy Muslims attacked Britain, but things get a lot more complicated when those four grew up in an extremist environment which the government themselves permitted. On the one hand, British citizens were told we're fighting a war on terror. 
But on the other hand, their government helped and supported the terrorists. What's more worrying is that they may not have learned a lesson about this appeasement and collusion. Since at least the 90s, the government and its intelligence agencies put Britain at risk by harbouring Wahhabi extremists and allowing them to groom young British men for jihad overseas when it suited their foreign policy. Despite all of the data, on the 2nd of June, just over a month before the attacks, the terror threat level was lowered and the police were moved out of the city. The official announcement stated that at present there is not a group with both the intent and the capability to attack the UK. So on the one hand, officials were warning about attacks on the underground and were conducting drills and exercises in preparation. Yet on the other hand, they lowered the threat level, stating nobody was planning to attack. Subsequent government investigations have never adequately addressed this massive contradiction. On the 1st of May 2007, survivors and relatives of those killed on July the 7th 2005 delivered a letter to the Home Office calling for an independent and impartial public inquiry into the attacks. That was brusquely rejected by the government. Perhaps what's nonsensical and offensive is that survivors and family members of the victims had to wait five years for any judicial hearing. What did take place was an inquest, although it was long overdue. Its scope was limited and the coroner's main goal, without certain guilt, was to determine how the deaths occurred. Nick Clegg and David Cameron picked up on the events when they were in opposition and scalded Blair from rejecting the public's wishes. But now the coalition is in full swing. They too have shown no interest in getting to the truth behind Britain's most devastating terrorist atrocity. Rather than becoming more transparent about their actions and protocols, and more importantly their collusion with the very terrorists that citizens are supposed to be protected from, in November 2011, Foreign Secretary William Hague revealed plans to restrict further the ability of courts to discuss in public the work of MI5 and MI6, who suggested intelligence data should only be discussed in secret court hearings. If that was the case following 7-7, we may not have been privy to most of the information covered in this report. What exactly are they trying to hide? Amid the pain and anguish of the London bombings, one significant narrative was lost, that of British Muslims. They became victims both of the terrorists and of overzealous sections of the media and the establishment, which accepted the terrorists' definitions of Islam and imposed them blindly on Muslim communities living in the UK. To discuss more about the issue, I have interviewed prominent guests presenting their opinions. After the 7-7 bombings, the majority of British Muslims watched helplessly as the media encouraged leadership of the Muslim community to be overtaken by fringe elements, whipping up passions through an iconography of angry Muslims deployed to discredit the rest of the country's Muslim population. At the same time, Muslims were blamed for fanaticism. Could we say that the British Muslim community was the main victim of the bombings? What we saw after 7-7 was that it helped to further entrench hatred towards the Muslim community. If you look at the rise of attacks on Muslims, if you look at how the Muslim community is treated and spoken about, not spoken to, spoken about, it, we're treated as second-class citizens. 
And that's only going to get worse unless Muslims confront those that want to deny us our equality in this country and those that support or are actively denying Muslims their freedom in the Muslim world. There is a tremendous amount of stereotyping and we have to stand up and, uh, and attack it. Most people don't understand Islam. Uh, the, the background is Christian. They tend to have known Jews for several centuries. Muslims are new to a lot of them, so they, they regard the Muslims as the other. Um, and that means that the, they tend to stereotype. And we know the huge breadth of Islam, uh, the ethnic groups that make it up. You know, there's a, a Bosnian Muslim is completely different from a Bangladeshi Muslim in many cultural ways. You know, a, a, an African-American Muslim from, uh, from Chicago is different from an Arab Muslim from Saudi Arabia. They, they are not an homogenous body. They represent a huge variety of experience and uh, philosophy. So the stereotyping and lumping them together as one is wrong and should be challenged on every occasion. The worrying thing is that particularly when British newspapers tend to I identify the, any, anyone with a foreign background as, as likely to be suspect and that's quite wrong because 99.9% .9 of the Muslim population in Britain are perfectly law-abiding and they deplore terrorism as much as any Christian or Hindu or Buddhist or whatever. And so it's, it's appalling that just a handful of extremists can tarnish a whole religion the way that they do. So these uh, predominantly young men, but sometimes they're assisted by young women, these predominantly young men are not helping their families, they're not helping their religion. They have this misplaced and extremist view of what Islam stands for and their belief that a caliphate could rule the world, which of course is never going to happen. So the, the whole thing is built on, on sand. Shortly after 9-11 and 7-7 incidents, the Western media and in particular the British and American media branded two new terms, moderate Muslims and extremists. Yeah, I mean, the argument that's often put forward by many Islamophobes is that these people have become too extreme in their religion and that we need the more moderate Muslims to speak up. And you have to be careful of that language anyway, because when they say you should be moderate in your religion, what they mean is that you need to actively moderate your faith because if you follow it too much, you might end up blowing up a building too. Now, we know that's not true, but that's the argument that's often made by some of these ne uh, neocons and right-wing commentators within the UK and other, other Western countries. But indeed, no one can deny the very existence of fanatic takfiris committing atrocities in the name of Islam. D d look, don't get me wrong, there are some crazies in the Muslim community, of course there are. But the narrative that the Islamophobes and right-wing people propagate is not that these people represent a small section of Muslim society. The heart of their narrative says that this is what every Muslim can potentially become. And that is why Muslims just have to counter that. Yes, we have crazy people. Yes, we have stupid people like Anjum Chowdhury within our community. Yes, we have some crazy hate preachers, but there are some and, they, and the Islamophobe narrative around Islam and Muslims is incorrect. And that has to be confronted head on. There can be no leeway, no discussion around that because in their narrative, what it's saying is at the very fundamental basis of your religion, any of you could become extreme. Well, I think that it's good news that more imams are now speaking out against this because I think some of these young men fall under the, the influence of um, extremist preachers who have no real faith at all. What they're after is political power and money. They make a lot of money doing this. This is, a, this is like gangsterism because they have so much money. Um, and they, they disguise themselves as religious, but they're not religious at all. They don't follow the holy word and they don't follow the interests of their society. And so they're evil people. And it's good that more mullahs and more imams and more teachers are speaking out against them because the community needs to understand these young men who turn to violence and extreme, extremism do not represent the, the faith of the Muslim. So takfiri fanatics are also damaging real Islam, providing the argument for anti-Muslims to tarnish all Muslims as fanatics. Yeah, exactly. And the one thing I would definitely agree with you on that is, is that, that people like Anjum Chowdhury are presented as a face of Islam. But not only that, they're presented as it's the perfect boogeyman. You know, when you need a Muslim to make a stupid comment on the media, who are you going to send? 
you're going to send Anjum Chowdhury, aren't you, at the end of the day? And I think it's, it's very interesting because there's nothing that he says that actually helps the Muslim community in this country. It doesn't deal with Islamophobia, it doesn't deal with bigotry, it doesn't deal with the issues at hand, it doesn't actually tackle Islamophobes' narratives and what right-wingers and neocons are saying. So really, I don't buy for a second that Amjum Chowdhury is sincere. I think he's an agent provocateur and many, Mus and many other Muslims think so too. It's interesting though that many of these people um, are often propped up uh, to show the, you know, how Islam is extreme and it really feeds into what many right-wingers and neocons want to get across which is that Islam is alien to our Western way of life and it, it's just the perfect evidence to, to make their point that Muslims cannot fit into British society. This has provided the ground for anti-Islam forces to isolate Muslims in the West, blaming all Muslims for the atrocities committed by takfiris. They claim Muslims are the root of the problem, so they should deal with it themselves. The, the argument that says that Muslims need to do more to deal with their problems, that is actually something that Islamophobes push. And I don't think any Muslim should ever go down that argument. Because what it does is, it puts the blame on the Muslim community, saying that you've got this problem. Why are some of your people so backward and so extreme? And what are you going to do about it? And what it does is it creates more animosity towards Muslims by the general British public. Instead, what Muslims need to do is turn and face the Islamophobes and confront them and say, no, actually any extremist views or any anger within the Muslim community is not born out of our religion or our own general views. It's born out of Muslims saying they've had enough of Muslims being oppressed around the world. And, and that is what we need to do, just confront them head on on that point. Because if you try to, to reason with an Islamophobe, they're an Islamophobe. They're, you know, most of them are right-wing nutcases. They don't see you as an equal human being. They're not going to want to take your points on board. Anytime you try to argue, oh, Islam is peace, oh, Islam is like this, etc. All they will see is, is that Muslims are making excuses for their barbaric religion and their barbaric people. So what you do instead is that you confront them and say, no, no, it's nothing to do with our religion. It's to do with Western imperialism. It's to do with Muslims being denied their freedom and Muslims now be, be resorting. And that's the thing they've had to, as a last resort, taken up arms and gone to violence. But no Muslim wants to go to violence, it's, but it's because they've been denied freedom for so long. And when you make that argument, it changes what you're discussing. The discussion then becomes, why is the West, and why are Western nations, why and why have they allowed for Muslims to be denied their freedom for so long? And when you have that debate, the Islamophobes can't win on that because they know that most of this imperialism, it's not, you know, it's, it's you know, what they, what they want people to believe is that this Western imperialism is a result of that we need to clean up the mess made up by these Muslims, we need to stop these extremists. No, most of what's happened is because of Western imperialism and we need to confront them on any, if they make any other argument, confront them on that because that's the only way you can deal with a bigot. Remember to get online with us whenever you like. Our Facebook page goes by the name UK Desk Press TV and our email is britain at presstv.ir. Interacting with you and hearing about your ideas and opinions is definitely a priority for us. Carry on watching the monarchy because the monarchy will certainly carry on watching the UK. Stay well, stay safe and goodbye from me and the team.